Well, tonight, I must start with a confession. Hopefully you will not think too much the less of me for it, but it is a confession that I must make. I am not a man of person. I'm just not. I, my brain doesn't work like that. Uh, some people have the ability to uh, look at complex math problems, and they, they have the, the very odd thing of not only being able to actually successfully do them, but actually take pleasure in it. Uh, that is very foreign to me. I put a bunch of numbers and symbols on the page and say, oh man, why can't I just sit down and write something um, and try to make it sound nice? Uh, I don't want to have to think through all these problems. Actually, uh, I, the, the second part of my confession is I did a very good job from my schooling years of taking as absolute little math as, as, I, as, was, as was necessary. Uh, in high school, I was able to go through high school without taking calculus. Uh, that was a, a wonderful uh, blessing both to my sanity and to my GPA. And then, uh, so then I get to, to college, and uh, I'm sure uh, my friend James Dickey was much more intellectually curious than I was. I just looked for the easiest possible way I could satisfy my two credits of math. One of those I was able to do by taking a microeconomics class. Now don't ask me uh, why a fairly basic microeconomics, I mean, this is not advanced microeconomics, this is fairly basic microeconomics, why the powers that be at Duke University decided to make that uh, satisfy one half of your math requirement. Uh, but I was not complaining, and so I took that class and got a terrible grade. Uh, that is the set point. And uh, then I, so that was through one of them. Well, then of course I'm getting into my music major, and I'm really enjoying uh, taking music classes that I felt like I actually had some degree of competence in. But I still had this nagging last math credit to get out of. I mean, complete take, yes. So I discovered, much to my uh, glee, that in my minor which was political science, there was a class that exactly fit the bill. Statistics for political science. <laughs> and so I was able to go through this class of learning about you know, stuff like population size and studies and all that kind of thing. There was hardly any math in it whatsoever. And I was able to get through that class. And that, my friends, is the extent of my higher learning in mathematics. Oh. Now, that's, um, now that that confession is out of the way, uh, we can get on with the rest of it. Well, I say that to say, we here in this passage in Ephesians 3 have a wonderful little math lesson. Now this subject is, thankfully not calculus, it's not even algebra. It is a simple lesson in geometry. The Apostle Paul, enabled, filled with the Holy Spirit, tells us that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. To know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. So tonight, I'm going to ask you to open your textbooks, pull out those notebooks, sharpen those pencils, and let's take a look tonight at a divine geometry lesson from the inspired pages of Scripture. Before we do, let's open the word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for your love that surpasses all our knowledge that surpasses anything we can possibly compare it to. And yet, Lord, you have offered us here in your word a chance to peek into this love, to comprehend it, and not only that, to experience it for ourselves. And Father, I pray that as we come to your word tonight, that we come with an open mind, with open hearts, to hear this lesson, to put it into practice, and that through this message we would comprehend and know experience your love in a greater way than we ever have before. Father, be with every one of my words. I am a vessel of fit to give the sermon, but I ask that you would fill me with your spirit, that every word of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, first, we're going to talk about the lesson identified. Now, of course, if you are taking any class, 
there's always going to be a lecture. Right? Now, the lecture, what does that do? It sets out the lesson in verbal form. It says, here is a description of what you need to learn. And Paul does that here with this geometry lesson, with this spiritual geometry lesson. And I would just like us to look, take a little bit deeper look into this. This is such an incredibly rich piece of scripture. He describes it, the love of Christ as bread and length and depth and height. Now the first thing I want to pull out of this idea of, of Christ's love being measured is its reality. You know, it's very easy to think of Christ's love in very abstract and non-concrete terms. And I know that because that's far too often what I do. You say, the love of Christ. Oh, the love of Christ. What a great thing. A wonderful thing, the love of Christ. It's like if you go out to, to, to someone on, on, on the street and you say, what is love? If you find the right person, love? Yeah. Love's what unites us, man. I, you, you know those old straight dates skits that we used to do of where what is the meaning of life? I mean, you just take the broadest question and then there would always be the hippie. I'm thinking of that person. Your eyes have to always be closed for that role. And, and we can have that similar conception of Christ's love. Oh, love, we know, we hear about it. it it's just this nice kind of warm, fuzzy idea. Oh yeah, the love of Christ. That's so neat. But what Paul is saying here destroys all that. He's saying, what's the bread? What's the length? What's the height? What's the depth? It, it is something that is real. And uh, you know, we can talk to Luke here, uh, our, our resident architect, about anything. When he's setting up a, something uh, in, in architecture, he is coming up with his conception of the measurements. What are the measurements? What are... What, what needs to fit here? How is this all going to work together? And Paul here sets out the reality of this for us. It is, now of course it's incomprehensible. We can never know. It. But Christ's love is real. There's breadth, there's height, there's depth, there is length. So let's think about that reality. Second, let's think about the reach. The reach of this love. What are these dimensions. Now, commentators have, have talked about this, and, and I, I think they, they hit it right on the head, and I think it's worth just briefly touching over it. First of all, what is the breadth of the love of God? The breadth of the love of God. The breadth is found in John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Christ's love is so broad it is so wide that it's covered every single person on this planet for every single year that this planet has been in existence. Think about that. Think about the breadth, the real breadth of the love of God that in the same way that that love reaches to you, it reaches to every single other of the seven plus or how many other billion people on this planet and going back before God put foot Adam and Eve on his planet. Let that sink in. What a phenomenal, phenomenal breadth to the love of God. What is the length? What is the length? Well, we know what the length is. Before the foundations of the world, God loved you. That's how far back it goes. Before the foundations of the world, from everlasting, he is God. Before the foundations, God loved you. Think about that. God knew you and loved you before he made anything. That should give you some sense of your worth to God. He knew you and loved you. What is the length going forward? It's through eternity. We sing, what did we sing just now? The wondrous love. And through eternity, I'll sing on. You know when I was preparing for this message? I think I got another glimpse of heaven that I've never, that I've never gotten in before. And it is this. Heaven is not just going to be about these streets of gold and, 
this wonderful time where we're going to be able to praise God and this, this you know, marriage supper of the Lamb and the light uh, of, the, of Christ being the Son and all these wonderful things. It's going to be knowing the love of Christ for eternity in a perfect way. Think about that. What, what an incredible idea. Have you ever been, uh, if there's some, been someone that you deeply love, that could be a husband and wife, that could be a, a son to a father, and when you've been away, and when you finally meet for the time if you've missed each other so much, what is it? It's like you never want to let go. That love of being apart to now being together, we are going to feel Christ's love perfectly in heaven. Forever and ever and ever we are going to be inseparable. Now, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ that now it is. And yet, in, with our nature, with our sin nature and our imperfection, we don't know the love of Christ like we ought to. Forever, we will know the love of Christ perfectly. Let that incredible thought soak in. And when you think of heaven, think about that incredible love of Christ. That is the length that's going for eternity and it's, and it's been since eternity. What is the depth? The depth is beyond the deepest sin. Christ's glory is, Christ is glorified when the absolute worst sin comes to repentance. The depth is so deep it covers each of your sin, it covers my sin, it covers the chief of sinners, it covers the sins of the criminal next to the cross. That is the depth of the love of Christ. And what is the height of the love of Christ? We know that if we are in Christ Jesus, Christ, we are risen with Christ. We are set on God's right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power. That's the height of the love of God. That his love for us draws us to God's own right hand. That we have access into the throne room of grace. Do you know what the devil wants to tell us? You're not. You're not part of it. You're not, you can't be in God's throne room. Look at your sins today. Look, look, look what you did. You, you've, been, you've been discouraged today. You've been, you've been crabby today. You've been negative today. You didn't have a great Bible reading this morning. Don't even think that you can go into God's presence. And God's answer to that is, you know what? Nothing you can do merits you getting into my presence. It's my love. It's the blood of my son that allows you to come into my presence. Let's not forget that the height of God's love is to place us at the throne, in the throne room, where we can make our requests known to God. So we have the reality of this. We have the reach of this in every direction of this lesson. Then we have the reckoning of this lesson. Not only is this incredibly deep and broad and all these things, but what, is, what does Paul say? It passes knowledge. That is what, if we were to try to place a number on any of these things, if we were trying to place a quantity on any of these things, this mind couldn't do it. This mind can never do it. It passes our knowledge. So, we have the lesson identified. This is Paul giving us the lecture, saying this is what love is. This is what Christ's love is. And I encourage you, let's let that soak in. You know, sometimes I almost wonder whether we don't want to really, really dive into the love of God for fear that, you know, some people maybe talk about the love of God and never talk about the justice of God. So if we talk too much about the love of God, it kind of feels like, oh, maybe Lord, let's remind them about the justice too. We've got to make sure they get that part. But let's let this soak in. This is an incredible yeah, this is incredible riches. Paul describes it earlier as the unsearchable riches of Christ. So we have the lesson identified. Then we have the lesson individualized. Now you might think of this lesson as the lab. So we have the lecture in which Paul describes the love of Christ, and then we have the lab. We have the lesson individualized. First of all, let's understand the foundation for our own grasping of this concept. Paul says in verse 17 that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That ye, 
I love about this prayer is that it builds off itself. It says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Of course, it starts early that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Step up. That, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. So that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. So that ye may be filled with all the fullness of God. How it builds up each other. The foundation of you here is the foundation of every part of your Christian life. Faith. That is where the foundation is. Now, Colossians 2. What does Colossians 2 say? As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord. How did you receive Christ Jesus the Lord? Through faith. So, walk ye in him. Walk in faith. And the foundation of this is in faith. As we see here next, that ye being rooted and grounded in love. Before you are going to understand the love of Christ for yourself, it's, it can only come on a foundation of faith and of being rooted and grounded in love. Rooted. What is rooted? Like the roots of a tree. Now, we saw a couple months ago with that big storm that swept through here, you saw, you saw the tree <coughs> that were tipped over and the roots were sticking out. Now, that's not one of those trees. I noticed that some of those roots weren't very long. They weren't extremely long. The, the picture here is of a root that goes down and around and everything, and it's always grasped on love. That every part of that root is connected and is completely surrounded and surrounding this idea of love. And then not only is it rooted, it's grounded. It's grounded. In love. It's a building. It's a building that foundation goes deep. It's a building that has the foundation that uh, whose rock is Christ. It's founded upon the rock. In, in your life, do you have that foundation that allows you to know the love of Christ? To individualize that lesson that in your daily walk of faith, you can understand the love of Christ. So we see the foundation. And then we see, secondly, the understanding. The understanding that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, there's your foundation, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. Now, this word comprehend, it really means, it's not just kind of have this understanding kind of out here. It means to lay hold on. It means to... Uh, what Paul uses this word later uh, in, in some of the epistles is to apprehend it. To apprehend it, to grab it, to lay hold of it, to take it. And this, what interests me about, about this is where he says comprehend with all saints. Now why does he add in there to comprehend with all saints? I think there's a couple things, but one thing that I grab from this is that we are all in a journey together as a family to help each other more comprehend the love of Christ. There have been so many ways, I can say personally, that I have been increased in my comprehension of the love of Christ through you. Through you individually, in seeing different uh, circumstances that you go through, in seeing different acts of service that you do, and it says, oh, there's another piece of the love of Christ that I see in that person. I've seen that through, uh, through this year and more that I've been married. That, that, that Tabitha has been able to show me more and more of the love of Christ through the way that she is. And our comprehension, our understanding of the love of Christ is not just, just us feeling it all on our own. It's us as a body being encouraged by one another and by growing in that comprehension, in that understanding with all saints. It's, it's, it's a phenomenal thing. To comprehend those, that, that height, that depth, that length, that breadth. And not only is there that understanding, the last point to this lesson individualized is the experience. It's the experience. This is the kind of final stage that Paul sets to this lesson on love. That, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge. Now understand the, the paradoxes. 
He's saying, know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. So know something that you can't know. Okay, that makes perfect sense. Thanks. Uh, that's, that's very helpful. But this word know means experience. It means to really, really intimately experience. Now, this word know, you might, you might recognize, is the same idiom that is frequently used in scriptures to, to, to um, identify the intimacy between a man and a wife. It's, it's that kind of, ex, it's the experience of, of love that, that Paul is saying, I want you to have. It's not just up here. I want you to experience it. Now, how would this work in what we went through in the breadth, length, depth, height? How do we individualize it? How do we experience that? Well, what about the breadth? What about the breadth? In, in your life, have you experienced the love of Christ through you for the people that you come into contact with all around. You know that Christ's love extends to the whole world. Does it extend through you to every person you come in contact with? Have you experienced the love of Christ going through you that far? You kind of see that picture of how Paul is saying, comprehend the entire thing and know, experience what you can experience. Do you know the love of Christ in its breadth through you. What about the length? Can you say, from the moment I had understanding and I knew of Christ's love to me, through my entire life to this point, Christ, I have known Christ's love. Have I known it in the length of my days? Was yesterday was I experiencing the love of Christ? Will I be experiencing the love of Christ tomorrow? Will that be coming through me and everything that I do? What about the depth? Can you say honestly, yes, I know the love of Christ covers the full depth of my sins. I think of it this way. Have you ever been out on a lake and you wanted to know the depth of the water? What do you do? You pull out a paddle and you stick your hand over the side and you reach it down and you reach down that paddle and you either hit the ground, and you say, okay, pull it up, okay, and it's about three feet deep, or it keeps on going, and eventually your fist is in the water, and you're kind of reaching down there, and you say, oh, well, pretty deep, deeper than this, deeper than this paddle. I think of it that way, with the love of Christ and the depth of our sin. Have you experienced that the love of Christ is way deeper than the extent of your sin? Have you experienced for yourself? Well, you can't experience for someone else in the depth of their sin. You can experience it for yourself. You can know the love of Christ to be deeper than the deepest of all of your sins. And not just in a head knowledge, not just a comprehension that it's there, but a full experience of it. Just like I was saying in, in the previous point, that you know it so much that when the devil tries to attack you and say, the love of Christ can't cover that, the love of Christ can't get you there. The love of Christ can't do that. You say, no, I know the love of Christ is deeper than all my sin. And then what about the height? Do you know by experience that the love of Christ seats you at the right hand of the Father? Is your daily experience with the love of God saying, when I go to my knees, by the blood of Jesus Christ, I am seated at the right hand of the Father. That I can go, what does Paul say earlier? He says, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. That we know the love of Christ through his blood for us, that was shed for us, that we can go to that right hand of God and say, God, I'm coming here with boldness because I have access through Jesus Christ. Is that your experience? These things can't just be comprehension out here. They've got to be daily experience. So we've seen the lesson identified, we've seen the lesson individualized. And here is the final step to this lesson, and really, in some ways it's the most important. The lesson imparted. The lesson imparted. Because I think we know, we understand at least, that the love of Christ can never be grasped through human knowledge, through human understanding. And look who the author of this lesson is. 
Paul makes that very clear. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you. This is not something that you're going to go and you're going to say, I'm going to grab onto this and I'm going to stick it in my own head and I'm going to understand the love of Christ. And how do we know this? Go talk to someone who doesn't know Christ. Do they understand the love of Christ? No, they don't even comprehend the love of Christ. That's not even something in... They, they, they just can't get it, much less experience it for themselves. You're, you're not going to be able to understand it unless the granting of God God is the one who has this gift to say, this is access by faith. This is access through my spirit that is indwelling you. This is something that I can impart to you. I am the author of this law. I am the one who can make this knowledge shine raw in your heart. Here's the author. What about the ability? The ability of this lesson, this is, this is, this is incredible. Verse 20. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Now, Spurgeon talks about, about this, and he, and he says, I'll take his word for it, that Paul is just inventing a phrase in Greek to say this. Exceeding abundantly. It's like, it's like he's saying, it's super abundantly over, above, and beyond whatever you could possibly think this abundance could be. Just, the language is not enough to capture God and this granting that He has for you. It's so, it, it's just, it's just so marvelous, words can't even paint it. That is the ability of this author to make this real in your life. To make these abundant riches of comprehension and of knowledge, of experience, real to your life. That is the ability. And finally, let's look at the availability. The availability of this imparting, it comes in the next phrase in verse 20. According to the power that worketh in us. He didn't say according to the power that can work in us. According to the power that might work in us. According to the power that present tense worketh in us now. Friends, we have this incredible power available to us now. We have the exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or can even think available to us right now through the power of the Spirit of God. What an incredible riches. What an incredible gift. What an incredible power. And I'll end it with this question. I want you to think, imagine with me, that our brother Paul, well, I'm sure here, has the most super abundant store, treasure store of riches that you could possibly imagine. Fair assumption, right, uh, Mr. Montour, fair. Uh... And I am coming to you, and I'm saying, now, listen up, church family. Don't know if you knew this. That house in White Bear in the backyard, next to the fire pit. There is such a super abundance of riches that will cover every need that you have. And not only, I'm not just talking about one of you, I'm talking about every single person in this room, there are more riches there than what you could possibly imagine. And if you go there, he will grant this to you. He will give you the key to the underground storage facility. <laughs> where he's keeping all these in the super abundance of treasures. And he is saying, I am going to give this all to you more than you can possibly have reason for all. Now, I can think of really only a couple reasons you would not take me up on that. One is that you would say, I don't believe a word of what you just said. Of course, they'd be questioning my credibility, not, not yours, uh, Mr. Wallace. But they might say, you know what, I, I, I've been out there, I don't see where you can store all that. That's, that's crazy talk. I, I, I just don't believe you that there's all this store there that you're talking about. So it's not worth my further inquiry. I, I'm just going to let it go. 
What's, what's, what's another reason? I suppose there's another reason that you would believe me. You would believe that Mr. Malzor has these riches. But you know what? You're just kind of consumed with other things. And you say, you know, maybe I'll get some time to get over there and, and, and get that later. But I, I'd rather do some other things right now. Got to do some housework. Got to do some chores. Bid works really busy these days. I think I'll put it off until a little bit later. In other words, it's not that you don't really believe it. It's that you're not really to take the time and, abi and, and, and ability that you have to experience it. Now I'm going to make that same analogy to what we talked about tonight, the spiritual geometry lesson. We see here a passage of incredible riches that Christ has offered, that God is offering you. It was Paul's desire for the Ephesians, and that means it should be your desire for yourself, that Christ can dwell in your hearts by faith, in my heart, that we can comprehend as much as is possible on this side of heaven, the exceeding riches of his love toward us, and the breadth, and height, and the length, and the depth, and that we can know it and experience it for ourselves through the power of Christ that works in us. And my question for you is, do you not believe it? Do you, do you not believe that this, all these riches are there? Or are you and I letting something else get in the way of our pursuit of those riches? My challenge to you this week and to me is to pursue these riches. Every single day to go before God and ask that He would grant you in a greater way the knowledge of His love, the experience of His love, in the breath for others, in its height to seat you at the heaven, in the heavenly places, in the depth to cover each and every one of your sins, and to rebuke the devil when he comes and attacks you and accuses you. And in, in every single area that we have, and in the land, that every single day in the future, you will know and experience the love of Christ. Let's take this spiritual geometry lesson to heart, and may God further and show you His power to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask for. Let's pray. Father, thank you. What an incredible lesson. What an incredibly rich passage of Scripture. And we ask this evening, Lord, that you would work in my heart, that you would work in the heart of His body of Christ, that together with all the saints we would comprehend, we would grow in our comprehension of your love. And not only in our comprehension of it, Lord, but in our experience of it, on a day-by-day -day level. Lord, I ask that in this church, in the weeks and months ahead, everyone coming into this place would see and know the love of Christ through us, through your power, your exceeding abundant power that works in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.